Welcome to the war from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Americans had many frustrations and feelings about the war in Germany and Adolf Hitler in particular. This series, Dear Adolf, is a summer series over the NBC network in which six Letters from Americans, as written by Stephen Vincent Bonet, whose work we heard on A Child is Born during our Christmas uh, run, expressed American determination to fight Adolf Hitler. The sponsor of the series was the Council for Democracy, a group whose media campaigns, according to Digital Dele FTP, uh, dot com, were geared towards instilling the same belief in the value of the American system and a democratic government that the Germans and the communists established in the values of their systems and their people. We're going to present three letters uh, to, uh, to Adolf, dear Adolf, and uh, it, based on listener response, we may play the other three late letters at another time. Uh, these episodes come from July 5th, July 26th, and August 2nd of 1942. So let's go ahead and take a listen. Dear Adolf, a letter to Hitler. National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council for Democracy, presents Dear Adolf, a series of six narrative letters written each week by Stephen Vincent Benet, one of the nation's greatest writers. These broadcasts are based upon actual letters written to Hitler by Americans. Today's program, the third of the series, presents James Cagney, distinguished actor of screen and radio, relating the views of an American laborer as he addresses a letter to Hitler. Dear Ada. Dear Ada. Dear Ada. F number three. Welding. F number three. Dear Ada. We're writing you a letter. And it isn't in fancy words. It's written around the clock by the working stiffs of America. The guys with grease on their faces who know what work means. It's written in steel and plastics, carborundum and tungsten, rivet buckets and drill templates, planes and guns. How about it, you guys at raw stores? Okay. Send it on to Adolf. How about it, sheet metal? Don't waste our time. We're busy. Send it on to Adolf. How about it, production, inspection, engineering? On to Adolf. Experimental, metal bench, finishing and plating. Have no time to gab. We're busy. Send it on to Adolf. How's it coming, final assembly? Can't you read the chart, you donkey? The figures keep climbing, don't they? Send them on to Adolf. <laughs> ship going off and a new ship coming on. And eight hours from now, that ship will go off and another one comes on. And eight hours from then, same business. Because this is an American war plant and it's making war. But that is impossible, my good man. You cannot make war. Your work has only worked 40 hours a week. I have read it in your paper. Listen, sap, don't give me that baloney. Sure, we got a 40-hour week. Base pay. And wouldn't your sweated workers like to have one? How much did you work last week in your plant, Jimmy? Fifty-two. How about you, Shorty? Forty-eight. Mike? I don't know how long I worked it this week till I got the paycheck. Maybe fifty-six or sixty. I know I work overtime because we we got a rush to job, and it seems you gotta get rushed. Mm. Forty-eight, fifty-two, sixty. Well, why are you doing it? That kid's raising it. I get paid for the overtime, don't I? So what? The old woman, she telling me she want to fix him up the house. She say, Mike. Get her the lead out of your pants and I'll work on your rush job. The house, she need to be fixed. Just what I suspected. Just what I've always said. Apathy, selfishness, greed. Eyes that never look me for on the paycheck. 
labor is sleeping the switch. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Don't you realize that why you get paid for overtime? Our brave American boys are fighting and dying. You needn't tell us. We know. We got brothers in the Army and Navy. We got sons and nephews and guys that work at the same bench with us. We aren't spilling off about them, but we aren't forgetting them. We don't like the bunk and the oil and the big words. We don't like star-spangled orations that don't add up. But we know what we're doing, and we know what they're doing. Every time we throw a switch or pull a lever, every time we set up a new job, every time the whistle blows for the new shift, we know what we're doing. Over 20 million of us. And don't you be fooled about that. Hey, did you ever sleep in what they call a hot bed, mister? A bed that never gets changed because as soon as you get out of it, the guy from shift three gets in? Did you ever work in an asbestos suit in front of the hot steel? Did you ever work on high iron? Did you ever climb the poles? Did you ever go down the mine shaft in the cage and wonder now and then about the guys last week who never came up from shaft six? Did you ever see a man's hand chewed into red pulp just because he slipped up for a split second? Hmm? Then don't talk to us, mister. We aren't softies and we aren't pampered. We're working stiffs and we're tough. That's where you made your mistake about us, Adolf. You thought we weren't tough. You thought dough was all we were after. And you thought we couldn't think. Well, we're thinking now, and we're thinking about this war. We aren't thinking about it in slogans, axe the axes and set the rising sun. I guess they're all right, as advertising. But we're thinking about it like this. I'm a mechanic. Live in Seattle. Guess I wasn't so sold on this war at first. No, not even on the need for victory. Then I heard a broadcast. Listen to the names and trades of 20 Norwegians shot by the Nazis. Because they tried to escape to England. One of those men was a mechanic. Every time somebody grumbles about the war, I think of that mechanic in Norway. I think about him and me. Got that one? Okay. Now stick this one in. It's from an airplane plant. I have two sons who are in the American Army. I don't want to see them fail for lack of equipment. And here's where we're turning out the stuff. Every time I complete my particular work on an airplane assembly, I speed it on the way to my sons. And here's something just a little different. He isn't a skilled worker. He's nobody you ever heard of. He's just a rag peddler. Yes, I said rag peddler. But over here, Adolf, even rag peddlers can have the ideas of their own. And he says, I am an old man and an individualist. I was born in Germany. My trades are many, but now rag peddling is my only desire. In the dark streets and alleys, I see plenty rags of human minds. And once in my bundle of rags, I find your book, Mein Kampf. I read it because I want to know what it's about. After I finish that book of hate and nonsense, something happens inside of me. I have a strange desire to live till the biggest rag collecting job in the world is done. And I know it will be done. We will take your rags on par value, Mr. Hitler. The world will see you naked. The medals and uniforms of your Hermann Goering. The ropes of your Heinrich Himmler. And all the rags you accumulated will be collected. The rags of fear the sufferings of your tortured Europe will go with the swastika on the big rag pile. Adolf, your time is come. I want your rags. I am old, and I know when things are good and when they are rotten. And now, back to another war plant... And another workman. I've been buying war bonds with every spare dollar. I've been working on my war job with every ounce of strength. And let me tell you this. Hitler won't win while the boys in plant four keep working. Got it, Adolf? That's us. More than 20 million workers. 11 million union members all over the USA. 
Yes, I'm talking about unions. I'm talking about CIO and AFL. I'm talking about every union man in this country. Because we know what you do to unions, Adolf. You don't fight them and you don't debate with them. You wipe them out, hide and hair. Over here, a union button's a union button. In Germany, it means your controlled labor front. In Japan, it never existed. In Italy, well, can you imagine a Muslim union? There's just one thing about unions you've taught us, Adolf. They can grow only in a democracy. They can grow only on free soil. They can't grow inside your new order. This is what happened to them in your Germany. Calling local B-241 Berlin. Calling local B-241 Berlin. No answer. There's no answer. No answer from any local. No answer. Address unknown. All patriotic workers are now members of the labor front. All unions are now part of the labor front. There are no other workers. No other unions. Hans was secretary of the local. Have you heard what happened to Hans? Concentration camp. Term indefinite. Otto. He was treasurer. Otto. Otto. Died. Gustav was on the shop committee. Gustav. Forced labor in Poland. Typhus. That's the way it is in your country, Adolf, and in the countries you've conquered. That's the way it isn't going to be here. Eleven million union men are against you, Adolf. Day shift or night shift or middle shift. They're against you, and they're going to get you. And that doesn't go just for the unions. It goes for all labor. Let me tell you just one little story, Adolf. When Chrysler built its first tank plant, you don't get balmy weather in Michigan in the winter. But the guys on the job gave up holidays and weekends to stand and slush knee-deep, pouring 51,000 tons of concrete. It snowed and they blew on their fingers and put up 6,500 tons of steel in 70 days. And that was a year before Pearl Harbor. Well, what do you suppose those guys are doing now? Picking buttercups? They did it for overtime pay? Well, let's see your labor front match it. And confidentially, Adolf, it wasn't all for the overtime. Distressing, racketeers, labor czars, corruption, intimidation. Horrible, awful, distressing, scandalous. Yeah, we hear you too. We hear the voices that make for division. We hear the voices of those who would set class against class, whites against Negroes, Christians against Jews. And we know they're playing Adolf's game, and we're on to them. We hear the voices of those, not many but a few, who would rather beat labor than Hitler. Rather muscle in on labor than save the United States. And our answer to them, and you, is... <laughs> yes, that's coarse. It isn't refined. I guess we're not very refined when we get mad, Adolf. And we're getting madder every day. The worse you make it, the madder we'll get. We know about the guys in those tankers that you've been sinking. They were working guys like us. We know about the guys who died on Batan. A lot of them used to be working guys like us. There's a cap floating out on the Atlantic with a union button on it. There's a kid who was a smart mechanic, but he won't come back for his toolkit since the Japanese sniper got him. Well, they were us, and we're them. There's no cockeyed labor front in this country. There's no Gestapo pushing us around. We've adjourned the big strikes for the duration. We're doing that freely. We're giving up extras and working overtime. We're doing that freely. We're back of the president and back of the government. And we're sending you a letter 20 million workers long. It's written in steel and flame, in the planes that fly the ocean and the bombs that drop from the planes, in the ships that slide down the ways and the plants that work night and day, day and night. It's written in brains and muscles and skilled hands moving fast on the assembly line, in war bonds and war stamps and the sweat and grind of the ship. It's written in plain American, and it's signed, Yours to blow you sky high. American labor. How about it, assembly line? Bring it on to right out. The time's short. 
All out of production, maintenance, settle bench, center wing. And we get on the way out. The time's passing. How about it, 20 million workmen? Send me on the way out. Send me on. You have just heard Dear Adolph, starring James Cagney, the third of a series of six narrative letters written each week by Stephen Vincent Benet, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy. The program was directed by Lester O'Keefe, with original music composed by Tom Bennett, conducted by Joseph Stopak. These broadcasts are based upon actual letters written to Hitler by Americans. Won't you send in your own letter to Dear Adolf? Listen next week to an American housewife and mother's letter to Hitler with Helen Hayes as narrator. Copies of today's Dear Adolf, Letter from a Laborer, may be secured without cost by writing directly to the Council for Democracy, 11 West 42nd Street, New York City. This program has come to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Dear Adolf, a letter to Hitler. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council for Democracy, presents Dear Adolf, a series of six narrative letters written each week by Stephen Vincent Benet, one of the nation's greatest writers. These broadcasts are based upon actual letters written to Hitler by Americans. Today's program, the fifth of the series, presents the well-known screen actor William Holden, who is now a private in the United States Army Signal Corps at the Photographic Center at Soria, Long Island. Private Holden will relate the views of an American soldier as he addresses a letter to Hitler. Dear Adolf, this is me, one American soldier. My dog tag numbers in the millions. My draft number came out of the hat in every state in the Union. I'm from Janesville and Little Rock, Monroe City and Nashua. I'm from Blue Eye, Missouri and the sidewalks of New York. I'm from the Green Mountains and the Big Sky Hooten Plains, from the roll of the prairie and the rocks of Marblehead, from the little towns where a dog can go to sleep in the middle of Main Street, and the nickel-plated suburbs and the cities that stick their skyscrapers into the sky. I used to be a carpenter and a school teacher. A soda jerker and a mechanic. I used to be a hacky and a farmhand, a leg man and a bookkeeper. The son of a guy with money and the son of a guy with none. But I'm a soldier now. Four and one half million of us by the end of this year. Listen to the roll call. Adamowski, Adams, Anderson, Bailey, Bertillo, Brown. That's my outfit. That's us. The biggest and best trained army ever raised on American soil. Ski troops and parachute troops, motorized and mechanized, tank troops and tank destroyers, cooks and cryptographers, bakers and bombardiers. Cohen, Costello, Dougherty, Deeros, DuPont. From Alaska to Australia, from Australia to Ulster, in the cold skies and the hot, under desert suns and clear skies and jungle rains. That's us, the United States Army. And we're not writing letters, Adolph. We're on the job. We weren't picked out for our looks or Nordic names. We weren't picked out to hile heels or chew up small countries that never did us any harm. We weren't picked out to sit around on our parking spaces and wait for you to be nasty. Let me tell you a few things about us, about the kind of army we are. They won't make you happy. When my bunch first went in, we had a drill corporal from upstate Georgia. He didn't read the papers much. He'd rather go to town and pick a scrap with the MPs. But he drilled us well. Hut, hup, hip, warp. And every day he kept saying, Now, you boys damn well better pay attention here. This business is for keeps. That was March, 1941. But he knew what was coming, and we listened. But, well, most of us had left good jobs, and that seemed pretty important. 
We had a bunch of Italians, and they missed their spaghetti in conversation. We had a bunch of Maine lads, and they sweated under the Georgia sun and thought about the lakes beginning to melt back in Maine. We had some Poles. They knew the score. Their folks had heard from Warsaw. But they didn't argue much. They just kept humping. Yes, it was all pretty new. But when most of my company at the end of 13 weeks marched off to join a new division, well, some of them were bawling like kids. Because somehow, without lectures and orders and editorials, there had gelled a sense of comradeship that would make your well-advertised Gemeinschaft Geist look sick. And then we trained some more and waited for the answer you gave us that Sunday, you and your Axis pals. It's about time, one soldier said. Dalton, Davis, Dombrowski, Edelson, Edward, Para. Like to hear from some of them? Here's one from Ohio. Used to drive a bus. Now he's mechanized infantry. In the part of Ohio I come from, lots of people have religious convictions against war. Well, I keep these prayers at the back of my mind every day and believe these prayers. I pray for peace. But I'm not so much like those people in Ohio as I used to be. My convictions are that war is evil and that the evil men are those who started it. When you ask me what I have personally to be angry against the Nazis and the Japs, that is my answer. They have hurt me and my people by making us fight a war that in our religion is bad. I don't know if I've made myself clear, but Hitler is my personal enemy, and I aim to stop him. And prayers don't make a soldier, Adolf? Not by your book? Well, ask about Lee's army, the Army of Northern Virginia. They prayed when they felt like it. Here's another from a Marine, just back from Atlantic Patrol, and sore. Sore because he's been made an instructor and isn't with his outfit. All I want to be is where I belong, in a mortar platoon of the Marines. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to wave the flag or become Joe Hero. But surely patriotism is something more than knowing the words of the Star-Spangled Banner. I'll admit that ten years hence, nobody will give a hoot about what the boys in uniform did today. Those who die in action will be hardly a memory. Those who come back maimed will be an expense, a bore, and a nuisance. I've seen death many times recently and dodged it on several occasions. And if I get killed, well, what the hell. Nobody ever left this world alive, and very few of us get to die for a cause. If I do get through, I will have had the satisfaction of knowing that I did try to do a man's job. And here's a letter from Bataan, February 12th, 1942. Dear Mother and Dad and Francis, this letter may never be delivered. It will go to Corregidor and there await transportation. I am proud to be part of the fight that's being made here. The town may fall, but the eventual outcome of the war is foreordained. I've seen some horrible things happen and had my share of narrow escapes. But I have also seen some very wonderful acts of courage, self-sacrifice, and loyalty. At last I have found what I've searched for all my life. A cause and a job in which I can lose myself completely. Life and my family have been very good to me. And given me everything I've really wanted. Should anything happen to me here, it will not be like closing a book in the middle. In the last few months I have done a lifetime of living and been part of one of the most unselfish cooperative efforts that's ever been made. Mistakes may have been made, but that has nothing to do with the manner in which my comrades on Bataan, both Filipino and American, have reacted to their trial of fire. If that same selfless spirit were devoted to the world's betterment in time of peace, what a good world we would have. And how dull I can hear the younger generation muttering. 
This letter is written to send you all my love and thanks for just being my family. It is written with no so-called premonition. My chances are pretty good, so I'll send it on its way. Keep me flying, West, your loving son and brother. No, we haven't heard from that lieutenant, not since Corregidor fell, but we'll keep him flying. We're not talking about being Joe Hero. There's a long, dirty, bloody job ahead of us, and we know that. Wars mean filth and thirst and pain and the scream of dive bombers on top of you and going on to the end of your endurance and beyond. Wars mean seeing your best friend killed beside you, and it's only afterwards you have time to think about him because the line must be held. All right, mister. You started it rolling. We know the score. We're the guys who take cars apart and put them together just for fun. We're the guys who fiddle with radio sets and are crazy about the comics, Batman and Terry and the Pirates and Donald Duck and all kinds of people who do things they aren't supposed to do. The Army wasn't supposed to get away with bombing Tokyo, but they did it. The Navy wasn't supposed to sink four Jap air carriers in the Battle of Midway, but they did it. We don't build armies just to put guys in uniform and shove civilians around. We build them to fight and win battles. We build them just the same way we built the Boulder Dam and out of the same kind of stuff. And in back of us, all the time, there's a roll call and a knowledge. Pollitt, Frazier, Garrett, Hamilton, Harkimer. That's the muster roll of the revolution, Adolph. The muster roll of free men who fought for their country because she had to be born. And they got worse child than ours, and they got paid off in paper. And if they were living afterwards, they went back to their farms and hoed corn. But they knew what they'd done, and they were satisfied. Here's a Jones, Jacobson, Jackson, Kearney, Lee Fitzhugh, Lee R.E. That's the roll call of the Civil War, Adolph. And out of it, the Union lived, and a free thing went ahead. It cost blood and toil and long bitterness, but it made us one nation. Levinsky, Leibowitz, Liggett, MacArthur, McCook, Maganetti. And that's the last war, Adolf. The Rainbow Division and the First Division and all the divisions. The two million who went to France. And we came in late and had to borrow other folks' equipment because ours wasn't ready. But the record's written from Cantini to the Argonne. This time we'll have the equipment. Our factories are turning it out. And this time we aren't going to stop with just saving democracy and then running out on it. This time we're after a durable peace. And that isn't your kind. Nathan, Nathan, Nininger, O'Brien, O'Hare, Orlando. That's a few of the new names, Adolf. No, the role isn't finished. It won't be finished until you are. Papagos, Patterson, Prokash, Pryor, Quintanilla, Casado, Hugh Lung. Chinese, Italian, Greek, Bohemian, British, Mexican. The sons of men who fought six wars and won them. The sons of men who came here to get away from wars. We don't like being ordered around, though we'll take it and like it in wartime. We think that one man's just as good as the next and maybe better. If we feel like going to church, we'll go to the church we pick out, and the next guy can go to his. If we want to get married, we'll marry the girl we like, and the guy who makes a crack about her ancestry had better look out for his teeth. If we don't like the people who run our government, we'll change them by peaceable election. That's us. That's our platform. And behind us are 130 million Americans. Rakonsky, Rattray, Rourke, Saltonstall, Sekopanowitz. All the funny names there are. Yes, Adolf, the old names and the new. The names that made America from Jamestown to the Cherokee Strip and back and forth and across and up and down. Only this time the building will be bigger than anything we've ever tried. This time the roll call will not end with the armistice. Come on, Joe. Chiang Kai-shek, Churchill, Cripps, Curtin, De Gaulle, Litvinov, Kazan, Roosevelt, Stalin, Van Mock, Wallace, Wilkie. Yes, this time it's for a new world, but not for yet. Now it's the march in the mud and the heat on the steel box of the tank and the stutter of a tail gun from a bombing plane. And yet... The command is forward. 
Now it's fever and wounds and the stink of the slit trench. And yet... The command is forward. The command is forward. March! Vanilla or chocolate? Well, make it a double one with maraschino. You'll need it before we're through. You have just heard Dear Adolph, starring Private William Holden, the fifth of a series of six narrative letters written each week by Stephen Vincent Benet and presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy. The program was directed by William Sweets with original music composed by Tom Bennett and conducted by Joseph Stofak. These broadcasts are based upon actual letters written to Hitler by Americans. Won't you send in your own letter to Dear Adolf? Listen next week to a foreign-born American's letter to Hitler with Joseph Schilkraut as narrator. Copies of today's Dear Adolf letter from an American soldier may be secured without cost by writing directly to the Council for Democracy, 11 West 42nd Street, New York City. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Dear Adolf, a letter to Hitler. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council for Democracy, presents Dear Adolf a series of six narrative letters written each week by Stephen Vincent Benet, one of the nation's greatest writers. These broadcasts are based upon actual letters written to Hitler by Americans. Today's program, the sixth of the series, presents the distinguished star, Joseph Schildkraut, who will relate the views of a foreign-born American as he addresses a letter to Hitler. <laughs> Dear Adolf, Reich Chancellor, Reich Leader, Reich Destroyer. You know my voice. It is the voice of the peoples you have crushed and starved and shot. The voice of the peoples of Europe, held down but unsubdued. The voice of suffering peoples tricked into war on your side by their rotten and stupid rulers. The voice of suffering peoples beaten down by your armies. But waiting, waiting, waiting in terrible patience for the dawn and the liberation and the end of you, Adolf Hitler. It is underground, that voice in Europe. It burrows like a mole underground. It whispers like the night wind through the air. It doesn't speak loudly yet. But when it speaks, your hangman dies. But my voice comes from America, not from Europe. I speak to you, and I speak to my fellow Americans. I speak for the alien born. I speak for many stocks and many mother tongues. I speak for old famous cities and peasant villages, for the lands where custom is old where the fields have been tilled for many generations, the lands of our mother's milk and our father's endeavor. And I speak for the men and women who left these behind to come here. We came here to this country as children. Why, we came here only a few short years ago. We came with no English at all, with a few words picked up somehow, with the painful scholarly phrases you learn in books and the scraps of old-fashioned slang we were so proud of knowing. We came in different clothes, different haircuts, homesick, excited, weary, looking forward, wondering, wondering if it was true, if it could be true, if America was what they said, if we would be welcomed or hated, given a place or despised. For roots are hard to tear up, Adolf, even for bread or freedom. The heart looks back for a while, even when the body has crossed an ocean. Was it true what they said, that this was a land where your stock or your birthplace or your name didn't matter beside what you were and what you could do? Was it true we'd have rights like the rest and a chance like the rest? Was it true that we could be Americans? Americans. 
hear my friend from the Lebanon. In my village in the Lebanon, when I was a boy, when the governor's carriage passed down the street, everyone jumped up and saluted. If you didn't salute, well, then you were due for trouble. Ours was a subject country, and when our village elders found themselves oppressed, they would raise helpless hands and say, Oh, it's your governor and your God. And there was no appeal from God or the governor. So when I came here at 20 with others of my compatriots, we knew little of many things. There would doubtless be governors here, just like our governors. So a man examined my papers at the port of Boston, and I stood before him, shaking in my boots. He was an official, a governor. But when he had finished with my papers, he got up and shook me by the hand. He wished me good luck in my new country. I have never forgotten that. I will never forget it. What did we find here? We found that neither race, nor birth, nor faith stood in the way of our advancement. We found a land that taught us the meaning of liberty and made of us free men. Now, we have no other hope and no other cause. Here, my friend who was born in Hungary. America is my country. And America is the home of my children. It will be the home of their children. My eldest daughter is in love with an Irish fellow. And she told me she dreams about him in English. This surely is my country when my daughter loves an Irish fellow and dreams about him in English and speaks to me about him in Hungarian. <laughs> I know how to read, but... My wife never learned how. But we both know we don't have to lick the boots of our bosses. And when my daughter's fellow, he's in the army. When he writes her a letter, it makes us all happy. What else can I tell you? I'm a citizen. I can vote. I never could do that in the old country. And I go to church. And there are no spies looking at me. And I can speak to God. And I don't have to mind Hitler. America must win. She will win. Here, my friend from Germany, Adolf, the Germany you slew. I fight you because you taught me the full meaning of a verse by the poet Schiller. Es kann der Frömmste nicht in Frieden leben, wenn es dem bösen Nachbarn nicht gefällt. A saint cannot live in peace if his wicked neighbor does not like it. I was a pacifist once, an intellectual, a thinker. You drove me out of Germany. I took refuge in France. For the first time there, I began to know what freedom is. Then you invaded France. I took part in that terrible retreat. I know what you did there. I do not want to talk about that. But I know what you did. In the end, by great good luck, I was rescued and came to the USA. And there I saw what, what amazed me. An organized democracy defending its freedom. Hitler, you will never understand what America means to us. You may boast of your ability in keeping the appearance that everything is well in Germany. This society here would break down the moment when everybody should say everything is well. It gets things done by criticism and discussion by 130 million people criticizing, discussing, and cooperating. And that is why you will never win this war. The American people are fighting for their way of life. They cannot be scared into panic. They will not be brought to their knees by your war of nerves. They become more decided every day your war goes on. They know they have no way but to win it. <laughs> Yes, I'm afraid you've been deceived about us, Herr Reichs Chancellor Hitler. I'm afraid you've been badly deceived. 
Yes, you bought a few traitors here and there. You planted a few spies. You caused a few deluded men and women to doubt democracy. Why, you've even tried your oldest trick on us to get us fighting among ourselves. Labor against management, Protestant against Catholic, Christian against Jew, native-born against foreign-born. But we, Adolf, we are the litmus paper and the test of democracy. We, the many, the uncounted, the ordinary, who quietly take our pledge to the flag you hate and the freedom you hate and the rights of man that you hate. No, all is not perfect here, Herr Chancellor, but I'm a free man, so I can tell you the truth, and I will. Yes, they talk about hunkies and dagos, mix and polacks. They say, oh, we got a many foreigners around here. They say, well, what can you expect with all these foreigners? Yes, that's quite true. And yet, Adolf, no matter where I go, no matter what bad accent I speak, I can say I am an American, and no one will there to laugh. These are good American names. Stone, Marshall, Saltonstall, Magruder, Frost. These are good American names too. The Guardia, Eisenhower, Adamick, Knutson, Nimitz. They are all good American names, Adolf. And as we say in America, that's all. Period, Adolf. Well, you know, I can't explain this to you because <laughs> there is no way of explaining it and your crazy mind wouldn't understand any of I can say that those who fight for freedom in the United States Army today have every name in the world, but still that isn't enough. You see, we are quiet, the alien-born, because after all, Adolf, we are still learning. We're even a little shy. When our children come back from school so assured and yet with questions, why, we are proud of those children. We see them grow big and free, taking rights for granted, and that's fine. That's just what we want, Adolf. But even they do not know quite the price of freedom as we know it. Not even they. We hear those long in the land who talk of their country, our country. We know who speaks true and who speaks false. And we listen well to those who speak true, Adolf, for their fathers made this land. But even many of them do not know the price of freedom as we know it. Not even they. We, the pilgrims of a thousand unnamed and forgotten Mayflowers, our freedom and our citizenship was bought with all we have. It was bought with a dream in our mind, the dream of a free, lucky country where life would be good and human beings equal. It was bought with travail and poverty and the wrenching up of old memories and fear and hope and faith. Yes, Adolf, with a great price we bought this freedom, and that price seems little today. We'd pay it again and again, how rice chancellor Hitler, skin for skin we would pay it. Ten times over we would pay it, Mr. Hitler. There was a town called Tlidice, Adolf Hitler. We know what happened to that town. There was a city named Rotterdam and a city named Krakow. And that is why we are against you, Adolf Hitler. We, the alien-born, the new Americans whose children shall be Americans. Against you and against you forever. Against you living or dying. Against you waking or sleeping. Against you every minute, every hour, every day. You would bring to this country the things we escaped and hated. You would poison the air and the water and the minds of our growing children. Why, you would drag them back, not even to the life we knew, Adolf, no, but to the life of a serf, the life of a slave. But we have tasted liberty, Adolf. We've seen liberty walk in the streets. No, right, we were not at Lexington or Gettysburg, but the names that we make today shall be names as shining. All over the country they answer, the Americans, the alien-born, all over the country they answer for the free world, the good thing, the old tradition and the new. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Those, Adolf, are Greeks. Italians, Croats, Slovenians, Americans. Those, Adolf, are Romanians, Bohemians, Russians, Latvians, Norwegians, One Americans. With liberty and justice for all. Those, Adolf, are Danes and Swedes, Irish, French, Spaniards, Americans. 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 Humbling voices, Adolf. Voices with accent. Very heavy accent. Every accent. But meaning, meaning every word, we who are the test of democracy, the litmus paper of democracy. I pledge allegiance to the flag 
of the United States of America. And that is all, Herr Reichschancler Hitler. That is all, dear Radolf. <laughs> Period. You have just heard Dear Adolf, starring Joseph Schildkraut, the last of a series of six narrative letters written each week by Stephen Vincent Benet and presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy. The program was directed by William Sweets with original music composed by Tom Bennett and conducted by Joseph Stopak. These broadcasts are based upon actual letters written to Hitler by Americans. Your letters commenting on the series will be appreciated. Copies of today's Dear Adolf letter may be secured without cost by writing directly to the Council for Democracy, 11 West 42nd Street, New York City. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. That'll do it for now. If you have a story about your experiences or that of a loved one in World War II, I'd love to hear from you. I welcome all your comments at box13 at greatdetectors.net. Ken Curlin provides the opening theme. Heroic, KenCurlin.com. Andrew Rines edits our sound. OTRWesterns.com. I'm your host, Adam Graham. The war is offered as a service of the great detectives of old-time radio. www.